I've got a video of Jerry Falwell Jr. vaping from a fallopian tube. (laughs) (laughs) Infirmary Media. Selling Out Podcast. What it does is reaches into your brain chemically and locates your happiest memory chemically and then locks onto that emotion and freezes it chemically and then it keeps your happy happy. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Selling Out Show. We have a great one planned for you today. My name is David Schultz, and by my side is my partner in crime, Nate Gorzinski. Nate, how the heck are you? I'm good. I'm a little little sticky and sweaty. It's been pretty hot up Ooh. here, but I'm not complaining about it, man. I've been waiting for summer all fucking year, so I'm 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 welcoming it. I live on a lake, so it could be worse. You can get just hot, jump I right in. Hit. Yes, sir. All this so. sweatiness and stickiness be gone just by jumping yes. in the lake. Even though I'm a little weary of lakes because of what kind of creatures live in there. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. So I, I'm the kind of guy, I'll get out of the lake and then I need a shower anyway because I'm afraid there's some kind of weird, like, amoeba. <laughs> right, right. Or poo yeah. on me. I hear you, man. We, we Our lake is a reservoir. It's fairly clean. Oh, here it's... we go. Yeah, but the occasionally, you know, there's definitely kivers and whatnot and some of the kids I know that, uh, like my... My girl's son and some of his cousins are a little weary to go in the water, leery rather, to go in the water because the the, the fish nibble at their toes and one of them swears they saw a snake. But hey, I'm I'm okay with it. There's nothing going to eat you. There's no no sharks in my lake. <laughs> no alligators. Like, you're like, my lake is cleaner than yours. It's a reservoir. A reservoir. Okay. It's much cleaner. So don't worry about the kivers nibbling at your toes. They don't poop. <laughs> my kivers don't poop. I live next to a reservoir. <laughs> <laughs> They're nah. fancy. Kids. Yeah, I've always had. I don't know if and I know you said there's no sharks in there, but ever since Jaws, for one, mm. I'm afraid. Yeah, something's gonna nibble on me. Yeah. And then too, there's a whole lot of pee and poo in there. I mean, there there isn't a pool too, but at least there's chlorine. <laughs> right, kinda, right. Kind of cleaning that out for you. <laughs> but me and the great outdoors, man, we just don't mix anymore. We're not made for each other. I am far mm. beyond that. <laughs> Nate, I'm in pain. I'll fear oh. it hurts. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that, man. That's my terrible oh. Larry Flint impersonation. I, yeah. I can't do a good one. Do you get a good Larry Flint? Um, I, I suppose I'd order a cappuccino and a butt plug. <laughs> <laughs> I'd get a, a latte and a dildo. I've got a video. Of Jerry Falwell Jr. vaping from a fallopian tube. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm in a lot of pain. I've had right. a lot of problems with my back. I've had a couple surgeries. And now I'm sitting in limbo with my doctor because they don't want to give me pain medication mm. because of the opioid crisis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the pendulum yeah. has swung the other way. The doctors, you know, used to overprescribe. Now they're afraid to even yeah, in medicate. Yeah, in New Jersey, I had a doctor who prescribed it to me like Tic Tacs. And, you know, I yeah, was in man. pain. It was legitimate. Yeah. But I'd go in and be like, man, my pain's right. like, you know, is it a 1 or a 10 today? I'd be like, it's an 8. She'd be like, oh, oh that dose. Give them more. And I was always a big fan of Percocets because, no, yeah. well, hey. hey well, <laughs> who was right. it? But they made me feel good. You know, physically, right? But I felt like Superman. I was up and at him, ready to go. I guess in a way, it's almost like a. And I don't want to go yeah. to the same degree, yeah. but as far as your energy level and, and everything, it's like cocaine. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a attitude adjuster. It's a you know you definitely that's that's one of the big issues with opiates. It's not that people always assume opiates knock people out. They think of heroin acts as these people drooling and falling over, but Man, to the people that use them, you can't really get out of bed without them. You, they give you the energy. They give you that feeling of 
of yeah you could take on the world man uh it's it's strange how things sometimes work the opposite way you think the way Adderall is given to hyperactive kids. Most of us get uh -huh. an energy boost from Adderall or Ritalin, but the people that need them, it actually focuses them and makes them super, yeah, like they, they I don't want to say they calm down, but they, they're able to settle and focus level on, out, on things. You know? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and that's basically where I was coming from with my pain meds too, is as much as I was hooting and hollering about how great Percocets were, they actually helped my back mm. significantly. Yeah. And now I'm in this spot where my doctor doesn't want to give me anything. Uh, I've had some right. x-rays done. It's shown that I have a scoliosis, which um, really is common, I guess, we, from, from what I found right. on Google. Yeah. Again, the worst thing you can ever do is Google, but I do it anyway. And and they were like, okay, <laughs> yeah. kids, it goes away. Uh, there's different variations of it. When you're older, it could yeah. be bad if it's degenerative. So you got to be weary okay. of that because this is scoliosis, a curvature of the yes, spine, basically. Exactly, it's not yeah. it's not aligned, okay. and I've never been right. diagnosed with that before, even having two back surgeries previously, two laminectomies. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm alarmed, you know. So I'm like, well, I guess we need the MRI, yeah. and she's like, you absolutely do. My insurance company has denied it now twice. Yeah. Twice. <sighs> so I I don't know why I get yeah. these rejection letters. It's just basically like reading Greek. You know, for me, you yeah. know, the letter will read, our independent physician has reviewed your file and found with conservative forms of medicine, you might be able to manage your pain. But how the fuck does he know that? Just by the x-ray, when everybody else is recommending I get the MRI. <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? So I finally, I, I've had a lot of problems recently with my doctor. This is besides the whole testosterone debacle for any of our previous uh, listeners who've heard yeah. about that. I won't talk about that now, but you're more than welcome to jump into our archive and uh, dip into my testosterone pool. It does sound <laughs> very disgusting. Wonderful. It, and, I bet you what, it's probably horrible. cleaner than your reservoir. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, but the thing is, is now it's like my doctor is kind of washing her hands or cleaning her hands with me. She's like, okay, I, I referred you yeah. to a pain specialist from now on. You go, you go to her. I'm not giving you anything. Wow. I'm not going to recommend any more MRIs. The insurance company is is not doing anything for you with me. So go to them instead. Shit. Maybe they'll have better luck. And I'm like, uh, yeah, thanks for fighting for your patient, doc. Right. She's passing yeah. the buck. Man. And of course, I call the pain management specialist and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll see you in about a month. We're booked up. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. So <laughs> here I am writhing in misery. Waiting yeah. for someone just to say, "Hey, l let me help you out, you poor crooked bastard." When it was an issue, though, the 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 way it swung back pendulum wise, when when it was the other way and they were over prescribing. I mean, I knew people. Uh, we're we're in Massachusetts. I knew people that would specifically take a ride, drive down to Florida, and hit all the pain clinics they could down there because their records weren't interlocked intermingled whatever you call it they 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 were completely separate so these people could hit one after another after another all these pain clinics drive back to massachusetts with hundreds of percocets and oxys and vicodin and all these opiates and because the pain clinics were just they're like stores man you just go in and they were giving them to anybody and just to to finish this off i i was actually in concord state prison over a decade ago with a gentleman who seemed completely out of place. This guy was very proper, very, very meek and mild, older gentleman, probably in his late 50s, early 60s. He was apparently, all of a sudden we saw him on the news one day when he had gone to court. He was at the time the famous Cape Cod doctor or whatever they called him, Dr. Feelgood of the Cape. And he was prescribing people left and right. And I, being an addict in there for drug-related activities, if you will, I used to get into conversations with the guy because he was under the the opinion he had the, he was of the opinion that whoever needed these things, whether they were addicted, however they came to be addicted, if they came to him, he was like, "Look, my issue is if they have access to the drugs they need, they're not going to commit the crimes, they're not going to do all the problems." And basically, the supply is the only issue. So he was thinking, as long as they just have what they need, what's the problem? And I myself have always pointed to someone like Lane Staley from Allison Chains, where if someone has 
unlimited access to their drug of choice. Eventually, all you want to do is that drug and your habit gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, that's all you're doing. Lane Staley from Alice in Chains was, would lock himself in his house for weeks on end. And when he died, no one knew he was dead for over a week mm. because no one would ever see him anymore. So my argument to this doctor was just, there's more to it than just the criminal <laughs> problem. Like, eventually it does take over your life. So it, 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 the best route is always to get off the drugs, folks. You know? Yeah, I'm so sure the doctor I, wanted to hear that. That was my argument. The doctor's like, fuck yeah, you. you know. <laughs> I was driving a Maserati. What are you fucking talking about? But, but you are absolutely correct. The best thing is to get off drugs if you don't need to take the drugs. But if you are in pain, right? tough noogies now, baby. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, I, I'm, yeah, and hopefully, sure. well, I'd assume, Florida has fixed their system. Because uh, I was just thinking about, yeah. the, like, they're just using paper. It's like they don't even use electronic, right. yeah. you know, forms of uh, communication anymore. Record keeping, yeah, right. It's like them right. with the fucking chads. They're just sticking with it, you know. <laughs> technology, fuck you, technology. Yeah, that's that's fucked up. It's interesting. I don't know if if you've uh, ever seen the the look of the jailhouse tattoo, Dave. There's there's a very specific look right. when you see chintzy jailhouse tats, mm -hmm. you know, and. Yeah, they they have a look, and I was surprised actually. In my years of of being in jail, I did see some quality ink, some great artists that actually did some great work. But the problem is the ink fades, of course, over time because they're not given real good ink. The the dude the the ink in jail that they use for tattoos is made basically by burning plastic whether it's, it's usually the it's usually the disposable razors that you buy on canteen and you burn the handles the metal the plastic rather handles and you put a paper bag over the burning razor because the floors are stone you don't have to worry about burning the floor so you so you burn this razor you light it on fire as it's flaming up you put a paper bag over it standing up over it to catch all the smoke which acts both to kind of cover the smell a little bit so the guards don't smell it as easily which you know doesn't really work but anyway that then when you're done when it's done burning the inside of the bag the paper bag is coated with a fine layer of soot black coating you know over the bag so you basically scrape all that black crud off the bag yeah it's like a powder at this point a black fine black powder and you scrape it into a container, you have this black powder, then they mix it with water, and basically it's just, I believe, water, and then they throw a little soap or shampoo in for some reason, and this, <laughs> I believe, is just jailhouse. Dude, this is like jailhouse I thought logic. that was like sterilization. I, <laughs> that's exactly yeah. what I think, dude. I think that the jailhouse folks think it makes it all cleaner, because oh. a lot of things they do in jail don't make sense, you know, but people have yeah. their reasons like for for example people make homebrew and they'll have the fruit and the sugar and everything which is all i'll use when i make homebrew but some of these people will throw bread uh, slices of bread because they say oh it's got the yeast man beer has yeast, dude they, do, they don't realize yeast in bread is already activated and dead it's not making your alcohol any right. better from what i understand but they do it and that basically just makes it so you have these clumps of soggy ass bread <laughs> in fermented fruit. So it's fucking gross. That's so fucking yeah. gross. <laughs> Dude, imagine drinking and getting a chunk oh, of soggy God, it's like bread. Spoiled in your milk or something. Ugh. It just sounds so yeah, unappealing. Dude. It's awful, man. But but back to the the ink. So yeah, they basically that's all it is, man. It's just the water and whatever whatever disinfectant soap or whatever they throw in there. Mix it with the black powder. And then whatever, they make a tattoo gun out of a motor from the hair clippers on the block or whatever. And they make a needle out of a mm. sharpened paper clip or, or a piece of the screen out of your window. They break off and make like a little needle. It's all Mickey right. Moused. But, but dude, jail is all jailhouse MacGyver's. <laughs> Like, I've seen people smoke crack out of a chicken bone <laughs> in there. So it's like, <laughs> no I believe lie, you. Man. I believe. <laughs> but... So jailhouse tattoos, it gets me thinking of these these two guys, man. I don't know if 
our listeners remember. It was a big thing a few years back, and I'm sure it's still an issue in a lot of facilities, but MRSA, it's a, uh, it stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus Aureus. It's a mouthful, but it basically means it's staph infection. It's a staph infection that's resistant to methicillin, which is like a strong antibiotic. So it's basically super, super staph infection. And any open sores, open spots on your skin are susceptible, especially in facilities like a jail or a, a, a hospitals have MRSA all the time, ironically. But anyway, dude, these two guys that I knew got locked in. They were cellmates and they got locked in together. They both got whatever it was, a week of lock-ins for some reason. So... They had a tattoo gun. They were both tattoo artists. They were just like, well, fuck it. We'll just sit in here and tattoo each other for the week we're locked in and just be covered with ink by the time we get out. So, dude, these guys just, yeah, they were writing on each other, these shitty-ass tattoos. They weren't the best artists. And so after a few days, we noticed they're calling the nurses over because... They noticed they were having all these blisters Surprise! and bubbles all over their fucking fresh tattoos. Yeah, dude, they're all gross and infected. They had to fucking tell the nurse to because they got to try antibiotics yeah. and this shit's serious, dude. You know, it's fucking MRSA. They were trying to deny that they were fresh tattoos. Like, it's just a coincidence that these MRSA bubbles just happen to be forming under some like scabbed up ink on them. Like, on top of that. Dude, when you go into jail, they document all your existing tattoos and scars and whatnot. So for identity and and to know right. if you're getting new ink on the inside, because mm-hmm. that's a, a offense in there, you know. So so these morons were getting shitty tattoos made with ash and shampoo, and then they get bubbles all over themselves. They get, they get lugged to the fucking hole after that because. They ha- are tattooing each other, and they lose their good time that they'd been accruing. And and on top of it, yeah, they c- contract some crazy staph infection that's really hard to fucking cure. So, anyway, those dudes were, yes, yeah, not the brightest guys. But but anyway, I don't know, man. This it got me thinking also about... So, the MRSA got me thinking about this dude I used to buy dope off of on the street. And I didn't know this guy from jail, really, but I knew him on the street... And he was in a wheelchair when I met him because he had actually lost mm-hmm. his leg from MRSA that he got in jail. And I <laughs> I don't know if it was from tattoos, but, but yeah, he, dude, he lost a leg. And he had to, he had a big lawsuit going against the jail. And w- when I knew him, it, like I said, it was on the street, but the lawsuit was still going on at that time. And he sold dope. So he was one of those dudes that holds a sign on the street corner, like the homeless guys, they call it stemming. You stem for cash, you stand on the street with a sign. For some reason, they call it stemming. But I would call this guy ahead of time, and he would hobble over from his spot on the corner where he was signing over to the Dunkin' Donuts or whatever to go use the public restroom. And then in the restroom, he would remove the appropriate number of bags of dope that I had ordered from inside his crutch where they were hidden. It was pretty fucking clever. You know, people weren't searching his crutches or even thinking about Like, then he would go post back up at the street corner with the shit in his hand, the dope, and I would drive up, hand him the money, and he would hand off the dope. And it all just looked like (laughs) I was giving this bum money out of charity. So nobody was, (laughs) nobody was the wiser, dude. It was pretty clever, you know? I, I don't know, that was... It's a pretty smart, smart dude. I don't know how he contracted the MRSA, but anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know whatever happened to him. Yeah. Like if he ever got that settlement. But honestly, dude, if he did, he probably just OD on dope with it, you know. And knowing the guy, mm-hmm. he probably OD'd and died before he ever even saw that money. It was he was just like, dude, he was a rough junkie, just like this old fucking crusty junkie that spent the majority of his life on dope and the the worst thing dude that i think about him is that that settlement that he had against like coming from the lawsuit or whatever may may have fucking been the best thing to happen to this guy like i know that's really sad but like it's it's just kind of fucked up like 
that dude's like, yeah, I lost, you know, I lost a leg and I was in jail for a long time, but dude, I got all this money coming. I can get so high. <laughs> like, Hey, listen, you know, slow down, dude. Maybe grim. he, he won, he yeah. got the money and yeah. he started a, a internet startup, uh, and created yeah. a company that, that sells a new kind of crutch with various compartments to, to hold things. <laughs> and, and he's actually like a millionaire right now. We don't know. Wow. We'll see him on Shark Tank. Exactly. You, you know, could man. see him on Shark Tank. Yeah. I, I do I do also think it's funny, like people behind you must have been thinking like, Oh, yeah. there's one of those motherfuckers that gives those people money. What a nice guy. <laughs> That's a nice guy right there giving that poor son of a bitch ten dollars. Wait, how how much how yeah. much is he charging you? Well, I mean, I'd go there with anywhere from he sold forties, so I'd go there with at least forty Very bucks. Charitable. If somebody's watching, they're like, oh, "Jesus, yeah. this guy, yeah. he's a really nice guy." <laughs> Did he just hand him a couple of twenties? <laughs> yeah, right. The other Jesus. thing I'm thinking about is these two dudes that you told me that ended up contracting the MRSA. If you're if you're in a oh, cell yeah. and you're tattooing shitty tattoos on each other for a of week, course. there's going to be like you know yeah. a moment of lost inspiration at at some point where you just like doing tic tac toe. <laughs> On the bottom yeah. of each other's feet or something like that, just for shits and giggles. Right. I mean, how many? Yeah. If you if you were in there for a week, how many tattoos could you think of? Right. And I, I'm right. I'm stopping myself from saying from you know what you'd actually want because I think at that point it doesn't even matter what you do or do not want. But but yeah. still, like, what would sound like a good good or bad idea? Like, if someone said to me, "Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. put a dragon on your wrist," you're like, "Yeah, cool, that's badass." Right. But then you know, four days later, it's like. Yeah, what about a uh, Tweety Bird on your ankle, man? <laughs> exactly. You know what what's left to do? Yeah, how, how many crosses and fucking rosary beads can you do, <laughs> man? Uh, spider web tattoos. It is a jailhouse, man. You see, fucking spider webs and rosaries, dude. That was always the tattoos. Like, I I had let a few bids that I did. I let people know that I was an artist, which is well that I draw right. that was a shitty thing to do because people are always bugging you. And if you want to, if you're that type of dude, you can make a ton of money. I've mentioned before, there's a lot of jailhouse entrepreneurs, but dude, if you, I'm not the type that likes to draw on demand. I just like to draw on it when it strikes me. Yeah. And these people would be like, Oh shit, dude, draw a picture of my kid. This, you know, draw a picture of this. And then it was always, dude, everyone has a pair of hands praying with a rosary wrapped around them and like whatever saying please forgive me or mama i tried or blah 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 you know it says it says ubiquitous or whatever as the teardrop or the barbed wire fucking, tattoo yeah or the lightning bolts on the white dudes <laughs> you see a lot of those oh yeah yeah yeah, man. I was gonna say the, the the one I think they should bring back is the tiger clawing through the skin. <laughs> yeah, that dude. needs to make a triumphant Something return badass. to people's uh, bodies everywhere. Because now it's all fucking different languages that people don't know what the fuck it means anyway. Right, right. It's always a white frat boy with a fucking Chinese symbol on his neck. Oh, it was. Uh... And you know that they're jokingly, you know, Asian people are putting like, I, I don't know. I eat human waste, you know, or weird symbols that say stupid yeah. shit. You know, there people are like, oh, it, it means pride and honor. But then a Asian person looks at it and starts <laughs> giggling. Because that means I can handle 20 really talk. Says, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who's that pop star? Exactly. Who's that one? Ariana Grande. And she did yeah, something yeah. on her hand. It was some kind of, I, I, I forget what language it was. And, of course, she had immediately had to rush to Instagram to show off that she's got yeah. this, this ink on her hand. And then people flocked to reply and say, that is not what that says. You have it wrong. <laughs> and, of course, she must have been fucking embarrassed beyond belief. But, hey, that's the culture we live in. Everybody's going to be like, oh, look at me. Look at me. I'm first. Or, oh, my God, yeah. look at this cool thing I got. It's like, shut up. Yeah. Shut the fuck up. Relax. Yeah. Everyone wants to be unique and the funny thing is people conform into nonconformity if you know what oh, i'm yeah. saying they all they all think they're being unique but they all end up doing the same thing so they're all they're all doing the nonconformist exactly. thing so they're you conforming. nailed it yeah. and you know just to, if yeah. you don't mind me closing this out here 
My thought is, is any all. of these motherfuckers that go get that foreign language shit that you can't understand or you don't know what it is tattooed on you, here's what's going to happen. Mm. We are going to lock you in a hot cell with two dudes with massive cases of MRSA for a week. Sure, we all know vaping saves lives, but now I want to save you some money. Visit NorthlandVapors.com. Proudly made in North Dakota, Northland Vapors line of e-liquids contain no artificial sweeteners, are dyke-tone free, and won't gunk up your coils. Whether you're quitting smoking or an experienced vapor, Northland carries a variety of flavors and hardware, making it a one-stop shop for all your vaping needs. Northland believes quality doesn't need to be costly, and right now you can use code SELLINGOUT19 and save 19% off their already amazing prices. So what are you waiting for? Get your head into the clouds and shop online at NorthlandVapor.com or visit their locations in Moorhead and Bemidji, Minnesota. Some products contain nicotine, adults only. So as of tomorrow, as my child does not let me forget, I will be 41 years old and he doesn't let me forget Mm -hmm. because he constantly reminds me, dad, you're going to be 41. Or if my wife says, oh, daddy's birthday is coming up, he goes, yep, he's going to be 41. I go, well, fuck, I, ex- I know exactly how old I'm going to be. Thank you, little man, for, for making me feel like shit. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and it's always like mm. around these times in life where you reflect and you look back. You know, at, at first you're grateful, of course. especially with living the lives that we did. Where you go, well, I made it this far. Yeah. This in itself is a triumphant thing and it should be celebrated. I should be happy. And in honesty, I am, even though I'm more of one of those guys that I prefer atmosphere over gifts. Okay. If you know what I mean? like Experience. I, well, when, oh. when people say, oh, we're going to have a party for you. We're going to have cake. We're going to have this. That's all fine and dandy. I don't mind. But for me, a perfect birthday is just like a day of relaxing. Like, mm-hmm. you don't need to buy me a bunch of shit. I don't need a fucking, you know, expensive this or whatever. Or, I mean, they're nice. And I did get some presents this year that were very, very kind and very thoughtful. Don't yeah. get me wrong, but the most important thing for me is, again, the atmosphere, how the day goes, if, if I'm able just to be happy and be with my loved ones. But yeah, back to the reflection thing is I started thinking back on my life and I have a lot of regrets. A lot of people do, you know. Mm-hmm. And one of those things that I wish I could change is a laundry list of them. But one thing in particular that kind of bothered me this year more than any other was how badly mm-hmm. I treated women in the past. Oh, yeah. yeah. And when I say this, it's not because I was abusing women, hitting women. Well, I should stop myself. It, it, may, may, it probably was a form of abuse, but it wasn't violent. Right. Okay? I, I never hit women or, or did any kind of violent acts. I treated them like conquests. Especially when I was younger, I viewed all women as sex objects. And yeah. there's a couple yeah. of girls in particular that I can recall that were, you know, all over me and interested. God only knows why. Well, I, you know, I mean, mind you, I was an okay looking guy back then. <laughs> I mean, if you looked at me now, yeah, you'd be man. like, who the fuck would fight over you, fat ass? <laughs> but, but still, and um, one of them, I, I spent the night with one. I kicked her out. The other girl yeah. came in. And I was treating her bad, and I made her perform a sex act on me, okay? And I said, if you do this well, you can sleep in my bed. But if you don't, you have to go to sleep somewhere else. And this, who, who the fuck does this? And anyway, yeah. I woke up yeah. that morning, and she wasn't in my bed. She was on the little love seat across the room. And wow. I know. And, and yeah. I'm, I'm not it, – it pains me to admit that this is the kind of person I used to be. And mind you, it was a long time ago. You knew me then. Yeah, of course. You knew who I was then, and I was terrible. Yeah, we were all, you know, foolish kids. To women at that point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I was a foolish kid. But even then, I should have had more respect for women. And especially especially the ones that were willing to, you know, be involved with me. Yeah. Yeah. I I have a single mother who worked very hard to raise me without a father. You know what I mean? I never had any sisters or anything, but I should have taken her as an example and, and thought to myself, well, this girl or that girl that I'm not treating so well or being rude to, how would I like it if someone treated my mother that way? Right. And it sounds very simple and basic when you put it forth like that, but it, but that's because it's the right thing to do. Right. It's the right way to think. Right. And unfortunately, it's taken me uh, you know, all these years to – well, I shouldn't say all these years. I've been good. Yeah. And I try to live a good life, yeah. you know what I mean? But it took yeah. me a long time to finally realize that was bad fucking behavior. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure, man. 
It takes a while to, to learn things. It takes a while to break behaviors, break habitual behaviors, you know? And I don't know, man. I did a lot of things, obviously, that I'm not proud of in my life, too. And we all can just hope that the decisions we make going forward are better. And and then you put enough good experiences behind you, and next thing you know, it's that's your new habitual behavior. You know, hopefully right. the good ones are the become habits. So... I don't know. I Well, s- yeah. speaking of the same son that's a pain in the ass, reminding me I'm 41 every every 10 minutes is I try to instill in him. Uh-huh. You've got to treat people well. Yeah. You know, that's you, great. you really do. Well, yeah. that's the thing. I can't do anything about the past. Nothing. And it right. kills me. But all I can yeah. do is affect the world I live in now and do yeah. the best I can not to be some kind of toxic fucking lunkhead, you know, right. or, 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 or exhibit that kind of behavior at all. Because sure. I really stopped acting that way. I was going to say my late 20s, maybe. Yeah. So here I am at 41, finally looking back, going, ah, fuck. But uh, it, it's I spent more time, I think, being a fuckwad than I have been a, a decent human being. Yeah, but you're the the scale is is tipping. It's gradually going the other way, man. You know, the years are adding up, and and it's interesting in the 12 step community, the whatever the secret societies, if you will, the the whole. Eighth and ninth steps are all about making a list of amends, and then the ninth is, you know, making the amends, and they're they're well documented. They right. talk about them in movies and whatnot. And the thing is, there's there's an issue that a lot of people have where the amends they need to make can't be made. Whether the person that you wronged is dead, there's no way for you to contact them, or they just don't want to talk to you, or whatever it is, or it's it's something that it's too general. You, it's not one person or one thing. You just feel bad about a situation. So they suggest what's called making indirect amends where, yeah, you do something positive for or in that person's name if they're dead or if you can't contact them. You you do something that, you know, they would have appreciated or they would like you. You help someone if that it, something that would have made them happy or you donate money to a charity they would have liked or you whatever it is you you kind of pay it forward you do something nice while thinking of that person right. and with that intention so those are called indirect amends so you know at the very least or not at the very least that's that's just something you can do right and so yeah man i think it's enough that you've changed the way you not only act but think about things, and hopefully that's all we can hope for, man. That's... Yeah, we got to stop objectifying women. Absolutely. And, and, you know, now I hear these stories about you know women getting catcalled and everything else. I mean, on and on, yeah. or women not getting equal pay for equal work. All this stuff just fucking infuriates yeah. me. Absolutely. And I, I, I worry that I contributed to that in my past, and I really want to change the future any way I can. And and. This podcast, I guess, serves as one way because I could have said, oh, it's my birthday. Ha, ha, ha. Look at me. Everybody say happy birthday. But rather than that, I said, it's my birthday. Look at what kind of fucking piece of shit I was. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, look, you know, yeah. and I think, yeah. uh, I, I don't know, a lot, of, a lot of times for me, and I am a very conscious guy about what I did and everything else like that. I, I, mm. I just really wish maybe my message would get out to somebody else and they'll go, dude, I don't want to be like Dave. Yeah. <laughs> looking yeah, back well, all those years later and yeah. being angry and filled with regret over my behavior. I, I sure, hope man. I hope anybody out there listening, if you are acting that way, it's not too late. Change now. Because I live a fucking happy life. Dave from the Selling Out Show here to tell you about Spunk Lube. Spunk Lube is a multi-award winning lubricant used by professionals in the adult film industry. Spunk is available in hybrid, pure silicone, natural, and pink. Spunk is made with the highest quality ingredients and is non-staining, hypoallergenic, and cleans with ease. Enhance your love life with Spunk. Right now, Spunk Lube is buy three, get one free. There's no excuse not to give it a try. Spunk Lube, a high-end product for an affordable price. Visit spunklube.com today and you can thank me later.
dust off your LPs. It's time for Nate's Notes. Notes. I've done segments in which I've mentioned black metal before on this show. It's a um, colorful genre of metal music with an equally colorful history. I don't need to go into the theatrics and costumery, the corpse paint, the leather and spikes. I don't need to re-mention the church burnings and murders that marked the early Norwegian scene. All this stuff has been gone over ad infinitum by not just me, but by countless books, magazine articles, and film documentaries. It's inherently compelling subject matter saying nothing of the actual music. But of course, the music matters. Sure, it's interesting to know that a bunch of Scandinavians were worshipping Satan and committing arson and murder while dressed up like weird Viking metalheads with painted faces. But without a unique musical identity, black metal wouldn't have spread out to countless other countries and thrived the way it has in the years since those fabled beginnings in the early 1990s. Black metal started as a more stripped-down, gritty reaction to the overblown and almost mainstreamified death metal scenes at the time. The signature black metal sound back then was largely an underproduced one, scratchy and fuzzed out, lots of distortion over a frantically tremolo-picked minor key melodies on the guitar, a lot of simple and primal blast beats on the drums, which were mixed so muddily that it was just a hissy blur of noise, sloppily keeping the beat. The vocals were screeched harshly and unintelligibly. Often, the lyrics were in Norwegian or Icelandic, but you couldn't even tell, especially the way they were mixed into the rest of the distorted blur. I realize that the way I'm describing those recordings, one might assume it's unlistenable garbage, and it's definitely an acquired taste. But oddly, the speed of the guitar and drums just gets washed out by the gritty production, and the result is a unique musical atmosphere that is really much more than the sum of its roughly recorded parts. As time went on, a few bands started experimenting with things like keyboards and somewhat cleaner recording techniques. Some bands would even put elements of Norse folk music and chanting vocals in their songs. It definitely added to the unique identity of the genre, but as a scene started by grumpy purists who were rebelling against too many frills in their metal music, there was a fair share of blowback. Early bands like Mayhem and Immortal, who stuck to the Neanderthal pounding on drums and guitars, had a lot of fans who thought it was too wimpy and cheesy to add synths and actual singing to the mix. To this day, there are the black metal equivalents to the Simpsons comic book guy, who refused to validate anything that isn't, quote, true black metal, meaning anything recorded audibly, or anything that dares to step outside the strictly basic formula created by the originators. But to most of us, the bands that do add some different elements are often the most exciting. In the decades since that initial Scandinavian explosion, black metal acts have popped up in countries around the world, from Asia to South America, France and Greece to the United States. And while there are a number of them that stick to the tried-and-true original formula, it's become more and more common to use that original formula as more of a canvas to work on top of. I mean, to me, the most interesting bands from those original acts were the ones that added keyboards, etc., to spice up this new sound. Emperor was one of the first acts to come out of Norway in those formative years, and they used keyboards and pretty complex rhythms to make their own, more symphonic version of that sound. Ulver was another one from that first pack of Norwegians, who actually moved on from the very traditional and basic sound of their first few albums to create some truly unique and experimental work ever since. 
Nowadays, I don't think you could even classify Ulver as a black metal band at all. They work with electronic instruments and produce mostly ambient music and trip-hop. A few bands, like France's Blut aus Nord, which I guess means Northern Blood, have found that industrial music partners well with the black metal template. They've produced a lot of really cool albums. Alceste is another French band that formed later on, but they worked in a lot of elements of shoegaze and indie rock. A strange pairing, one would think, but the sort of dark, somber feelings of shoegaze, as found in bands like My Bloody Valentine or Slow Dive, mesh pretty seamlessly with black metal. Alceste has a huge following, and for good reason. They actually inspired a lot of bands to create similar music. Of course, with its own subgenre title, now called Black Gaze, insert eye roll here, the Black Gaze phenomenon has caused a lot of controversy in black metal circles. I've already mentioned how fans of the genre are pretty attached to genre norms, and can be resistant, to say the least, to changes in their beloved scene. At least Alcest kept some of the visual trappings going for their early work. The real problem started with some North American acts working in the Black Gaze structure. Deaf Heaven is one of my favorite bands in this subgenre. They've gotten mixed reactions from the public at large, Hailing from San Francisco, they've basically ditched the whole spikes and corpse paint thing for your standard hipster haircuts and skinny jeans. Maybe a leather jacket or two. But these guys are charismatic dudes that smile a lot, and that just pisses off a lot of curmudgeonly purists. I know, it sounds petty and silly, and it is. To me, if someone is making genuinely interesting music, then I couldn't care less how they cut their hair, or whether they wear enough bullet belts and spiked bracelets, but these black metalers are passionate, to say the least. So, as a result, Deaf Heaven is one band that gets a lot of hate, at least in the comments section of YouTube. And to finally get around to the suggested song for this episode, Zeal and Ardor are another band that did something new with the black metal template. It's the brainchild of one guy, actually. Manuel Gagno, or Gagno, I'm not sure how you say it, but he's a Swiss-American artist of biracial descent. Not that it should really matter, but black metal, unfortunately, also has an unfortunate subset of racist fans. Not to get into it, but one of the subgenres of black metal is NSBM, or National Socialist Black Metal. I'd rather not acknowledge those acts, but I'll just say that when Manuel, from Zeal and Ardor, first started releasing metal on his social media pages, after initially being like an indie chamber pop artist, he asked the listeners online what they thought would be an interesting combination of genres for him to try mixing. Being a black man, Manuel got some cringeworthy responses, including one that said, Try mixing black metal with N-word music. But of course they said the word. Which could have meant like hip-hop or R&B mixed with black metal, but Manuel took it differently and decided to blend black metal with old-time slave music and blues. The irony is that this guy was trying to insult Manuel, and inadvertently gave him an idea that was new and exciting, and ultimately Zeal and Ardor gained all kinds of buzz and respect for their work. So, in summation, black metal is a genre that, despite occasionally being resistant to change, can really be an exciting field in which to explore new ideas. If you can get past all the harsher elements, there's a lot of stuff for a music fan to explore. Now, for those listeners who 
maybe didn't get a chance or didn't feel like listening to the song suggested, which was Come On Down by Zeal and Ardor. We'll just play a little clip of it for you guys here. Yeah, dude, I don't know. I, I think Zealand Ardor is one band that definitely, they take elements of things that may not sound completely unique, but the way they put them together is unique. And that's that's what I was getting at about, you know, them. I, don't, I know it's not your cup of tea, you're not a metal guy at all, but could you at least appreciate the elements that he threw together and the way he did it at all or was yeah you know what i like the most is the backstory that you told me about the uh the racism yeah and it was like okay this guy wants to come at me like this you know what i'm gonna do that and yeah. it's pretty pretty uh it's ingenious yeah it really is the, the, the that's a really great approach right man like a few years ago this, this song full disclosure is actually a few years old and the first thing that he put out was some, I forget, it was a short EP that he just put online. It was never released physically. And it got so much buzz somehow. I guess nowadays all these SoundCloud artists or Bandcamp and whatnot, people are breaking through that way. So people started listening and he got reviews by popular YouTube reviewers and whatever. And the buzz was created. And his next album, his full length, which is called Stranger Fruit, which is a great album, is, yeah, it was looked forward to and, you know, highly anticipated by critics. And it really didn't disappoint. I, I feel like everything he's he's put out has, has been unique. Some of it gets a little repetitive. Some of it, it's all done by this one guy, Manuel. He plays with a live band, obviously, but all the music he records... Is just him with a recording onto a computer. It's all done by this dude. And wow. yeah, yeah. Like I said, he was, guy. yeah, he was online and was asking for suggestions. Like, and like you said, he, he, he took, he took the lemons people were throwing at him and made fucking black metal lemonade. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And also speaking of suggestions, if anybody out there ever wants to reach out to us, it is easy. You can find us on Twitter at Selling Out Show, on Facebook at Selling Out Show 1. You can give us a call and leave us a voicemail at 774 701 1993. We'd love to hear from you and, and you know your thoughts too on this whole Nate's Note segment because I'm really digging this, setting us up with a song, an episode ahead of time yeah, man. Uh, thing that you're doing here. I like it. I think that's, that's cool. cool. So, what do you have planned for us next? Well,. To be honest, I was, I wasn't sure. You know, we were down to the wire here recording this and I Ooh. realized I just, I wasn't sure. So I'm gonna, I'm going to go old school. Nothing new mm -hmm. here. I never claimed to be breaking new artists here. I just wanted something that will pertain to what I'm going to speak about next week. So I will throw out the song New Dawn Fades by Joy Division. So we will post a link to that on our social media pages, and we will, uh, yeah, we'll talk about it next week. Right on. Sounds very, very cool. I look forward to that. And before we let you all go, I do have a couple of notes uh, about uh, fellow podcasters I want to bring up, some guys that we really care about. First off, it's Chris from the Professor Frenzy Show. I got to say thank you, Chris, so much, because he keeps getting me out of some comic book binds. and. Uh, it's, he's not someone I know like in real life personally, you know what I mean? Yeah. Only on the internet and everything, but he couldn't be a nicer dude. The professor frenzy show could not be a better program. I mean, they shout us out every week. Absolutely. They put, they put forward top notch content on indie books. If you're into that, check him out. But he has been sending me 
some Swamp Thing books that I have not been able to get a hold of on my own. Wow. And that is, yes, really, really kind. That's gold to you. Oh, baby, like nobody's business. And actually, I've been reviewing the Swamp Thing television show over at the GWW.com. If you want to, you know, read those, maybe get my opinions on what's on screen. I always say from source material to screen right because I'm a, I'm a tagline motherfucker. <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to mention is our, our friend Reggie, who actually had a guest appearance on this show. And uh, right. he's from the Cosmic Treadmill podcast. He fell ill, seriously ill, mm. uh, to the point where he could have lost his life. Jeez. But luckily, Jesus is right. Luckily, he bounced back. And I really didn't want to. I've known about this for a while now. I really didn't want to bring it up. Uh, until I knew I had good news, and thanks to his partner on his show, Chris, uh, we've been informed that Reggie is doing well. He's doing great. Excellent. He's talking again. He's moving again, and I couldn't be happier. He's a real nice guy and a, an asset to the podcasting and, and the comics community. So good for you, Reggie, and I hope the best for you and your family. Absolutely. Now, as for us, it's time to hit the bricks. The party's over. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And I do want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in. We appreciate it. Virtual hugs for all of you. I am Dave. That is Nate. And this has been Selling Out. Peace. Wake up, the devil looks so glow. Tell me how we know they can hear us coming. It's easy for me. I got a head start running away. Keep up for your disease, spread quick. Infirmary Media.